right, good morning. I'm going to invite you to stand as we get ready to worship this morning. Before we get started, I just want to remind us that um, after our first song, I'm going to release our kids to meet back at the kids' banner over here to my right, your left. Um, and our kids' team will be there waiting for them. And we have our security team who's there as well. And so when I transition them, they'll go to meet their kids' leaders who will then walk them over. And so parents just put you at ease that, that they are in great hands as they transition. We're not just sending them out the door on their own. Um, and so I just want them to be prepared for that this morning. In Psalm 150, it says, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Take a moment and just think of, of, of a way that the Lord has been great in your life, where you've seen him show up. And he didn't just show up, but he showed up with excellent greatness. It says, praise him with trumpet sound. And our instruments might be a little bit different than, than uh, what's listed here. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Loud clashing cymbals. That's right, that's right. And then it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So I want you to take just a heart check this morning. Take a deep breath and ask yourself, am I breathing? Has there been breath put in my lungs? Did I wake up on this side of the dirt? If there's breath in my body, then I still have a reason to lift my voice in this place today. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord.
our kiddos back to the kids banner where the team is waiting for them there they can go ahead and move into place miss jesse's got her hands up ready for them we're excited for them to be able to go and continue to worship the lord and learn in the kids area god bless them as they go thankful that there is no junior holy spirit he is well able to minister to them and we're asking him to do that this morning amen Amen, church. I invite you to fix your attention on the King of Kings, the only one worthy of our worship this morning.
Jesus, you're 
like you in the heavens or on the earth. There is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. And there is no one like you in the heavens or on the earth. And there is no one like you. God, is he beautiful today? Oh, let's give him praise. Father, we exalt you. We give you glory, Jesus. You are beautiful. Man, my mind, my heart going to Psalm 23. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Is he your salvation this morning? Yeah. Clap it back. Listen, whom shall I fear? There's nobody to fear. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid, though an enemy camp against me? My heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet will I be confident. And then this is going to sound familiar, church. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Amen. This is one of those days. You can cross it off your list, and there's still more to the day. You can keep worshiping him. But it doesn't just end there. He says, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So you've come to gaze upon the beauty, the majesty, the purity, the holiness of our God and to inquire of him, whatever your need may be, whatever your, your, con your issue may be. Or maybe you don't even realize what it is. The Lord's going to bring you a word today. How many know the Lord's got a word for you today? Amen. You're ready for it? Prepare your hearts. Prepare your hearts. He says, for, I will for he will hide me in his shelter. This is his response. He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. This is one of his tents, a gathering place. When the body of Christ comes together and his presence shows up, he will lift me high upon a rock. You have come. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have come to the right place. You have come to the right place. You can reset my clock because that was all intermission right there. Praise God. How many are ready for the rain? Uh, some of you are like, stop the rain. No, I'm talking about the rain in this place. Amen. The rain in this place. The R-A-I-N and the R-E-I-G-N. Did I get it right? The rain. Amen. And I'm thankful for the rain. I got my sprinklers fixed and then the rain started coming. Praise the Lord. Double duty. You know, Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6 a powerful key to the kingdom and a principle that we need to remember, and that is this, you reap what you sow. It says you reap what you sow. What you, you get out what you put in. And so, sowing seeds matters. Preparing your field for the harvest matters. Seeds matter. Listen to me. If you, if you plant an apple seed, you get... And if you plant an orange seed, you get, and if you plant nothing, you get, listen, tithe and offering, it's not just the moment, come give your money, we need to pay the bills. This is an opportunity to worship God, but to plant your seeds, prepare your harvest for the rain that's coming. I heard a story about two farmers, and they both desperately needed rain. It was dry their crops, their land dusty, and they needed rain. So they both knelt down and they prayed for rain. But only one prepared his field for the harvest and sowed some seed. 
Now, the good news is this. God brought the rain. And they were both refreshed, and they were both blessed. But only one was prepared for his field to receive the rain and to receive the harvest, that, to bear fruit for the harvest that would come. And it really comes down to this. Who really trusted God? One prayed for rain, but one prayed for rain and then prepared. So who really trusted God? And are you trusting Him today? Listen, tithe and offering, trusting God, they go together. It's an act of, of faith, but it's an act of trust. God is going to bring the rain, church. He's going to bring the rain in His timing. The question is, will, be, will we be prepared when that rain comes? Will our fields be prepared? Will they be ready for harvest? So what we do is we come in here and we worship. We come in here and, and we hear God's word and we learn and we grow. We come in and we serve and we give and, and, and we give our tithe and our offering and honor God because we're trusting him, his mission, the greatest mission ever, to know him and for his presence to be in this place and then to share him with the world around us. Can I get an amen? So the question is, are you ready for the rain? You reap what you sow. What a kingdom, a kingdom principle and a key to the kingdom. There's several different ways that you can give at Bold City Church. I think they're on the screen. You can bring cash or check. You can text. You can go to our app and go to online. We have two giving stations in the front. We have two in the back. If you do give online, we don't want you to just sit in the chairs, click the links, and watch everybody else worship. So we've provided these Try Me cards, and they're up at the giving stations. So if you've given online this week, or if you're going to give online, would you join us when we step out to worship? Grab one of the Try Me cards, put that in, and let's honor the Lord. Father, we love you. I thank you for every person in this room, Lord, who has prepared their field. Lord, who is ready to sow seed, God, and is giving to the greatest mission and to the greatest kingdom cause ever, ever established. And Lord, I pray that we are preparing for the rain, that we're ready for what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. Lord, there are souls here today that need your touch. Lord, you've already prepared the way right now, Lord, with worship, with the word about to come. Our hearts are ready to receive. But we get one more opportunity to worship you with our giving, to fellowship and to honor you. And so I pray you bless the gift and the giver and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you step out with me and let's give. There are two in the front, two in the back. And then take a moment to greet each other, and we will see in just a moment. As you continue to greet and find your seat, we want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us here today. If you're in the house, we are so glad that you're here. Our team has been working hard. We got here at 6 o'clock this morning. We have been uh, laying things out, getting things ready, setting up lights. So would you give a big hand clap to our serve team? Amen. Many of them will be staying to help. If you'd like to join that, you can uh, talk to somebody at the hub on the way out, the inside or the outside hub. Thank you for joining us online. It's a privilege to be able to minister and to share with you today. Uh, if you're new here, it's real important. If you're new here, if you're a guest, maybe this is your second or your third time, but we haven't gotten a chance to meet you. We want to make sure that we know that you're in the house with us. And so would you, if you're in the house or if you're online, would you text the word at any time, would you text the word guest? 
the word guest at 860-850-BOLD. It's on the screen. That's 2653. 860-850-BOLD or 2653. So if you're a guest, if you're sitting next to a guest and they're not have their phone out and they're not typing it in, we want to make sure that we knew you were here. We want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. And we're just thankful that you made the choice. Uh, to stop by. If you don't text, if you don't want to do that, we do have a hub that's inside right here and one out towards the food, uh, towards the Hope Truck. We'd love for you to stop by and meet one of our greeters and uh, let us have some information. Uh, also want to remind those about our online streaming. Uh, our team is amazing, but one of the problems that we've had over the weeks is just getting a consistent connection and uh, being able to do that. So our solution has been pretty simple. We're capturing all of the, uh, of the service today and uh, we're going to restream it. It's going to be online. So if you're watching online and you want to see the most recent service, uh, go Monday night. That's tomorrow night at 6 p.m. on our YouTube page, and uh, you'll see a live full version of our service uh, for you to be able to watch and to see. And if you're watching this today, we're really glad. We appreciate that you've joined us. Uh, this is actually last week's service. Um, and uh, if you are in interested in seeing today's, uh, this week's service, then... Uh, Go to the YouTube page and check it out tomorrow, 6 o'clock. But next Sunday, uh, we'll be restreaming it as well. That's why we're in the gym, getting a connection, making all that work. Are we happy? We are happy. The, <laughs> the last uh, announcement is an important one because uh, our kids are going to youth camp, but we also have Bold Week coming. I saw that. We have Bold Week coming. And uh, if you uh, know that this is a, a staple in our church, an important outreach, an important ministry, we're really going to prioritize prayer this year. We're doing half days, so we're going to be serving in the morning, serving during the, the, the morning hours, and, and then serving lunch as well. Uh, we'll be praying throughout the day. Uh, we want you to sign up. You can go to our app, and you can sign up there, or you can meet up with, with uh, Brittany. Brittany is going to be after service just out these doors and to your right, where it says Bold Week. If you've already signed up, she actually has t-shirts already. So if you've signed up, uh, you can go by uh, the Bold Week, step and repeat, and collect that. How many are glad the announcements are over. All right. I know you like seeing me and hearing me. Give it up. Let's have Pastor Jason come. Praise God. Amen. Can we do a collective check, uh, check in on Pastor Randy? You all right, Pastor Randy? He got going there. <laughs> Hey, uh, really quick, I just want to piggyback on the Bold Week thing. That is our local mission trip. And, uh, and so if you've never been on a mission trip, here's a great way to do that and sleep in your own bed. Um, and so it's an incredible opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ, but also connect with the Lord in some public spaces and, uh, and just make sure that the, the schools know, supernaturally speaking, that Jesus is Lord. Amen. And to get into battlefield for our young people in prayer, to get into the spiritual warfare uh, when we're in the schools. Amen. All right. So we have a crew that is leaving today. Some have already gone. We are meeting in Alabama with Voyage and Pastor John and their youth group. And we are doing camp in, in Alabama. And so there's a big group leaving, a bunch of young people. I think the buses, what time they meet, Pastor D? Four in the morning, five in the morning? Four in the morning. You always got a crew that will stay up all night and sleep on the bus ride. Can we pray for our youth? Because I believe that their lives are going to be marked this week. Can you guys just agree with me in prayer? Father, we just thank you that you are already at Monday night and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. God, we ask that you would absolutely wreck our young people with your presence and your word. Lord, that the teams be unified, the churches be unified, that you be greatly glorified through the unification of, of people serving. God, bless all those who have taken off of work this week, all those who have given to help young people go. God, will you bless them that they're, because they're sowing eternal seeds. Lord, may the lost be found and the broken be healed. God, may the captive be set free. Lord, would you mark some young people, mark some young people this week. God, may 20, 30, 40 years from now, may they still be following Jesus because of what happens to them this week. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, really quick, I got to be obedient to the Lord. I think this was for me, but I felt strongly like I felt prompted to share this with you. 
Okay, I'm in a season where I was like, all right, this week I was like, hey, I was planning out the fall. I'm excited. I was like, I felt released to do some series and started working. But then as I start to work through some things, the Lord just keeps bringing me back to this like daily bread spot where it's like every day I just need you to completely rely on me. Like I understand you want to be super planned, Jason, and, and, and all that. But right now, if I want to pivot and I want to do something, Jason, you need to submit to that. And so I've been learning how to do that. Amen. And so I was going to revisit the culture shock, culture shock series, if you remember that from like 2015. Uh, it just seems super fitting with, with kind of where things are going and, uh, and plan to do that. And then the Lord started moving on me Friday about some Hebrews 12 stuff about a kingdom that isn't shaken. And so I was like, okay, maybe we'll start culture, sh culture shock next week. Well, uh, this is, I, I felt prompted this morning to open up Hebrews and to go to Hebrews 12 in the first scripture. And I believe this is a word not only for me, but for many people in the room. So I just want to share it really quickly. This isn't the sermon. This is maybe something more prophetic. Uh, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. That's what I want to talk about really quick is like if you're carrying something heavy, lay it aside and the sin which clings so closely. And the Lord gave me a vision. Don't go back to things you used to use to cope. Do not go back. And then, listen, we think sin, we think, oh, he's talking about alcohol or drugs or something of that nature or whatever. No, no, no. Anything that would replace God, anything you would lean on more than God, lay it aside, get rid of the sin, don't go back to the sin that you used to cling to. And listen to this, let us run. Let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us. Endurance, think faithfully. Don't quit even when it's hard, amen? This is a word for somebody in here besides just me. When it's hard, it's difficult right now, don't go back to what used to chain you up. Don't go back to old coping mechanisms, old ways. Stay the course. Continue to run the race, right? Why? Looking to who? To Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Who? Listen to this. This is kind of, this is a, a revelation that we are to endure this season. Who for the joy set before him, listen to what he did, remain faithful. He endured what? The cross. Not pleasant times. Embrace the difficult season, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen? Come on, this is a word for somebody. I know you're looking at me like, Pastor, I don't, I don't, no, for real. It's not easy. It's not easy right now. Do not lose sight of Jesus in this. He sets the example, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so the word is, listen, do not go back. Amen? Don't go back. If, you're in, if you find yourself at a crossroad right now in a difficult season, don't go back to the things that you used to do. Don't go the old ways. Stay the course. Eyes fixed on Jesus, even when it's not pleasant. And so, listen, I, I prepared to, to kick off like a six-week series. And Friday, I get a text at 1026 a.m. from a friend of mine. Who, uh, who pastors a church outside of Tampa, who I've known for, for 12 years. Hey man, I'm on my way to a conference to speak at a conference in, in Georgia. Just happened to be in the area. Would you wanna grab lunch? My wife and I are, are up. And I was like, uh, I didn't see it for an hour later. I was like, man, you come by my house. I came by the house. We ended up going to have lunch, but we sat and talked. And the, it took about two minutes in that conversation. I was like, this is absolutely a divine appointment. What was coming out of their mouths was ministering to Tiffany and I, and it resonated so well. And so we, we sent them on their way um, to their conference. They, they, they left and went and ministered up in Georgia and had plans to be there all weekend. And last night he texted me as I was sitting in my office and I was going through Hebrews 12 and praying and preparing for today. He said, listen, my wife and I really feel like we're, we're supposed to be in the house with you guys. We're actually going to leave the conference early. We're going to come down and be a part of Bold City on Sunday. And when I read that text, I was like, hey, would you communicate? 
would you communicate? Because I, I just believe that there's something prophetic here. And he was like, I don't, I don't need to, but I'd be honored if that's what you want. And so we called an audible. And so it is a great honor for me to introduce you to a guy that I have watched be faithful to the Lord for 12 years. He's after the presence of God. He's after the, the he's, listen, He's sincere in his pursuit of God. I can promise you that. And I pray that you pick up on that this morning as he ministers the word to us. And his wife is here as well. So could you do me a favor? Could you just stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Gio Munez to the, to the platform? Oh, thank you, guys. My wife said I had to move these because I will trip. So here we go. I'm being obedient, it's first act of faith today. So thankful to be with you guys. Um, I love that you have a pastor that is willing to shift everything when he believes God is moving in a certain direction. Many, many pastors have plans and it's hard to divert from the plan sometimes. And so to be able to even pull an audible and say, hey man, we're just gonna make space for whatever the Lord has, I think is really special and it speaks about Pastor Jason and Pastor Tiffany and, and what God is doing in this space. And, we're so thankful to be back in this region. Um, I actually got saved in this region. I came at a, as an 18-year-old drug addict kid right down the road in Ocean Way, and that's where I actually met the Lord and spent probably five years in this region. Um, met my wife here, some of my really good friends, so it's so good to be back. It's where I would have met Pastor Jason. I think at that time we were, you were doing Generation Next. We packed around, they packed around 200 kids. It smelled like cigarettes, marijuana, and B.O., and God would just move, and that was the craziest thing. It was like the most unchurched environment ever, and it was chaos, and then all of a sudden, he'd come up and minister the word, and those kids would get rocked. It was just a supernatural thing, so thankful to be able to be part of, of what God is doing in this space, and we do believe that God is doing something. Say amen. amen. God's doing something. In this hour, he is shifting. He's changing, and while many of us, we want to be in the middle, I, I love this moment because I feel like I'm right in the middle of what God is doing. And even though we don't always understand the why, the how, the what, it's comforting to know that even though I don't know all of the variables, God is a constant. That he's stable in all of his ways and he's faithful in everything he does. And that's kind of been the journey and the storyline of my life. I didn't know that I was going to come to Ocean Way and give my life to Jesus. I never knew I was going to be in ministry. I came from the most dysfunctional home of dysfunctional homes. It was like I got accepted into the program as the kid that's like, man, if he makes it, he'll have a great story. You know, it's like it wasn't, I should have been in Teen Challenge. I should have been in a different environment. But, but I see that, that, that God throughout my story that he is authoring. I love that Pastor Jason read Hebrews 12. I mean, God is authoring a story in every single one of us. And not only is he authoring a story, he is perfecting that story. It's a storyline that he's writing. It's a, it's a narrative that he is creating in and through your life. And it's important that you give your yes to that. I mean, there are many houses and many houses with many mandates. By house, I mean church, right? And we're a part of a spiritual family, but I believe there's this, a very specific assignment on this house. That God has called this house to be a place that hosts his presence, where Jesus can come and recline and rest. And, and maybe you don't understand what all that means. You're like, oh, that sounds kind of abstract. It means that you have a, a sincere invitation from God to host him in a significant way where he will come and mark and transform lives and you will see those who are lost become free, those who are bound be liberated. And that's what the Bible says, right? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's freedom, there's liberty. So as we host the Lord and as we come into his presence, I believe that Bold City Church has a very specific, and I would say to you, crucial assignment in this region. Now, there are many houses, as I said, that have many important mandates, meaning God has called them to do something specific. But what a beautiful invitation for Jesus to say to, I'm going to say us, because I feel, we feel connected, to say to us, hey, I want to, I want to dwell in the midst of what you're doing. I'm looking for a home where I can dwell, not just visit, but that can be a habitation for my presence. And why is this important? Why is this crucial? Because the presence of Jesus changes what? Everything. When we come together on a Sunday morning and we fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, anything is possible in that place. Drug addicts can be healed. 
the sick can be healed, marriages can be restored, everything can shift, mental disorders can be healed, everything can shift in the presence of God. And while we are in a season of transition, and God is shifting many, as Pastor Jason says, we're, we feel like we're in a season of daily bread, where it's day by day learning. The Bible says this, lean not on, all, on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will what? To direct your path. He'll make your path clear. And we are in a season where Jesus is drawing near to us as spiritual family. And He's inviting us to draw near. And we may not know what the next month, weeks, years ahead look like, but we can know that we are being led by the Good Shepherd who knows how to lead us beside still waters and green pastures, who knows what's best for us. Only God can do this. Could you imagine if you were in a difficult situation and you're like looking for counseling? And I walked up to you and I said, hey, um, so I hear what you're saying. I know, that, I know that you're going through a hard time. I think the best thing for you in this moment is Geo. You'd be like, shut up. It's conceited. But, but God is the only person in all of the universe that can say, hey, I know everything is in disarray. And I know you want to run and you want to hide and, and you want to go the opposite direction. But, but the best thing for you in this moment is me. And what I've learned in difficult times is many times in my life, and maybe not yours, but in Gio's life, in moments of pressure and misunderstanding and difficulty, I find that God is putting me in a corner and he is dwindling Gio to God and only God. Jesus and only Jesus. Where my soul is vying for all of the other things that are, that are promising something, but always, I will say always will lead to emptiness. If money, fame, social static success would have given it to you, you would have already had it. But here we are on a Sunday morning at the end of July because we're like, no, 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 there has to be more. There has to be more than the American dream. There has to be more than just going through the motions. And I want to say to you this morning, friend, there is more. There is a God who's very intentional. I'm telling you, you may not feel that. You, you may feel bypassed by God. And sometimes in life, you know, we have a saying at our church, sometimes life be life in. It's like the more you do the right thing, the more all of the things go wrong. And you're like, I don't understand. Like, I feel like I'm doing all, like I'm, I'm obeying you. And the more that I do what I feel is right where you're leading me, it's like everything is going wrong. And in these moments of pressure and misunderstanding, the Lord invites us to know him as good shepherd as leader, as beautiful one, as the righteous one who is in control of all, the one who is seated above everything and is in control. How many of you know God's not in heaven worried about who's going to be the next president? Now, all that matters. It matters because we want to be faithful with what God has given us, right? But God's not worried about what's going to happen. He's not shaken by the news. He's not worried about the economy because he holds all things together. And so for those of us who love him, how many of you love him? That's the whole room. We love him. He works all things for good. It does not mean that everything's going to be good. But you can be assured that he works all things together for good for those who love him, for those who follow him, for those who have given him their lives. So this morning as, as, as I came, my heart was full. I just feel God's zeal, desire, delight for this house. And to continue forward into all God has spoken because God's promises over this house are yes and amen. That means yes and let it be. How many of you know when God says yes and let it be, it will be yes and it will happen? Doesn't matter what things, because we're not moved by what we see. We're moved by what he said. And there's a gap sometimes between what we hear and what we see. Sometimes we hear... And while we hear and we move in a certain direction, it doesn't always manifest immediately in what we see. But again, I want to encourage us with 2 Corinthians 3. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, he is contrasting the old covenant and the new covenant. And he is speaking to us about a more excellent way. Paul's making a delineation between that which was and that which is. He's not saying that which was doesn't matter. That which was matters, right? It matters the history of our faith and how we got to Jesus being on a cross and dying and giving his life so we can be liberated. But he's saying this, hey, listen, while the old covenant was amazing and Moses saw the glory of the Lord and he went up a mountain and they experienced something supernatural, what we have now is far greater. Say far greater. Let's try it again. Far greater. It's far greater than anything that those guys experienced. 
So then he gives us this language that I think is so powerful. He says now, say now. Now the Lord is spirit. This is verse 17. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This word liberty can mean emancipation from bondage. Meaning whatever has you bound this morning, according to this scripture, because the spirit of God is resting in this place, you have the opportunity to be liberated from sin, from the fear of man, from the opinions of others, from the voice of the enemy, we had the opportunity because the Lord is spirit. Where the spirit is Lord, right? Where the spirit is Lord, and he has the opportunity to rule and reign, there is liberty. And we all say all. How many of us? All. We all, with unveiled faces, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So what are we seeing? He's giving us access to behold him. To see him, as we said, we're a people of his presence. And we, this is a lifelong journey. We don't pretend to know what all that means, but, but we do sense an invitation, right? To draw near to God. His promise in the New Testament is, if you draw near to God, he will what? He will draw near to you. It's not, a, it's not a what if or a maybe, he will draw near. So we all with unveiled faces, meaning given complete access to God, we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And as we do this, we are progressively being transformed, which how many of you want to be transformed? I want to be transformed. Like there are areas in Gio's heart that I'm still working through. That I'm like, God, I, I, I need your help, right? We need grace. And so as we fix our eyes on Jesus, as Pastor Jason said, the author, the finisher, and the perfecter of our faith, we are progressively being transformed from one degree of glory to the next, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. So watch this. The Lord is inviting us, even this morning, you're like, man, my life is a dumpster fire. You don't know. You don't understand all that I'm going through and, and the feelings and the emotions and my soul feels raw. In this moment, Jesus is like, the remedy for right now is for you to fix your eyes on me. To stabilize your heart on what I've said and not be moved by what I see. And the promise is you'll be transformed. Day by day, from one degree of glory till the next. And you're like, man, I don't understand how that works. That seems to, I just, there has to be a better solution. But that's the problem with human nature, that we think we can do and strive our way into freedom. But we have been given the ministry of the new covenant, which says, when Jesus said, it is finished, he really meant it. He really paid for all of the brokenness, for all of the sin, for all of the bondage, yet still, I know there is an enemy who the Bible says he comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. He has come, and he has an agenda. The Bible says, beware of the schemes of the enemy. And the schemes of the enemy, they come to steal from you, to rob from you, and to destroy your destiny. To divert you in every other direction. See, the enemy doesn't have to set your house on fire and destroy everything to divert you from the God assignment. He'll be okay with you settling for something lesser than all that God has for you. I don't care who you are in the room or how, how, how disqualified you think you are. There is a God dream in you that is longing to be released, right? The Bible says in Romans that this, the whole earth is groaning for the sons of God, the sons and daughters of God to awaken. It's groaning, not for church to be filled. Right? We want, we want churches to be full because we want people to do family. It matters. But man, if, if butts and seats brought revival, then AMC would be on fire right now. That's not how we measure success. But the earth is groaning for sons and daughters to be awakened. And who are these sons and daughters? Romans says, those who are led by the Spirit, those are sons and daughters, which means the Spirit, again, He's leading us, He's drawing us, He's wooing us. And how many of you know that sometimes as the Spirit of God leads us, we don't always understand why He does it the way He does it? Oh man, I, so many times God has spoken to me. I got saved, as I said, in 2008. And for like three years, everywhere I went, it was like God would just touch me. Anytime any kind of prophetic person came into a room, I'm like, God, I repent of every sin. Because I just knew they were going to call me out and say something about me. It was for years. That was just the trajectory. It was like, man, there's so much favor. My life was going in one direction, which was hell and destruction, and God touched me. 
And all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh. And so 2011, I graduate from ministry school right down the road at Ocean Way. They hire me at the church. And I'm like, man, everything that I'm desiring God to give me, he's given. It's like everything, everything's like Disney World, cotton candy, happy. I marry my wife. We met in ministry school. And I'm like, everything is on the up and up. I'm ministering to young adults. I'm like, this is life. And then all of a sudden, I did not know that 2011, 2012 would become the hardest year of my life ever. For three, four years, everything was going the way that I thought it should go because we all have an imagination of how we think the God dream should play out. But how many of you know God is just as interested in the process as He is the, in, in the journey as He is the destination? Say it again. We're worried about the destination. God, you said let me get there, but God is very interested in the process. And this is very offensive because in a culture that is, man, if, I, if I'm ordering something from Amazon and it doesn't come next day or two day, I just don't believe God wants me to have it. <laughs> just, it's just not for me. God doesn't have it for my life. That's the way we live our lives. But God writes long stories. They're long and they interweave and there's beauty and there's ashes and there's joy and there's mourning. And he's in the middle of all of it. So again, growing up in a dysfunctional home, no dad, there was a lot of trauma. One of the things I wanted as a young kid is I wanted family. I'm like, man, I want to build what I never had. I want to have a wife with kids, and I want to do it with God, and I want to do church. And, and I'm like, let's do it. And I'll never forget about six months into our marriage, my wife having her first miscarriage. And it was very difficult. Like, I don't understand this. Everything was trending up and up and up. All of a sudden, it's like, What? And you got to wrestle with this, right? Because the reality is in my heart, I'm like, well, God, I know you know. I know you know. I know you know you know. Right? I know that you, want, you know what I want. So why this? But, but you move past it, right? You're like, okay, God, I, I forgive. I release it. I let it go. And we move on. And we're, we're young adult pastoring. And we're trying our best, man. We're 21 years old trying to figure it all out. And Moving forward, working on staff, and all of a sudden, I'll never forget being in our apartment. We lived on Dunn Avenue. We paid $4.50 a month. I bought a gun and everything. <laughs> I'll never forget being in that apartment and hearing this loud boom, and my wife scream, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it happened again. And while the first time we bounced back, this time we just did not recover. So now we're pastors on staff trying to figure out, they're like, man, you've got to keep grinding, you've got to keep pushing, you've got to keep going. And my, my wife gets diagnosed with bipolar, and they're all, she, she's being tormented by the enemy. I, she, every day it's, I want to kill myself. I don't want to live anymore. I'm like, how did my life get here? Again, I gave you my yes. I'm doing all of the right things, but I'm getting all the wrong results. And in that moment, it's so difficult to reconcile. There's, a, there's an expectation gap. My expectation and my reality are not matching up right now. There's something disconnected here when I'm sitting in doctor's offices. I'm not, being, I'm not able to build a family. My wife is working a job where the boss is abusing. It's, it's abusive. It's just so much going on. And so then my wife gets on medicine. She gets better. I get worse. I regress, I revert, I back, I mean, it's so bad. And it all culminates in me stepping into my pastor's office, sitting on a couch and crying and saying, I'm so sorry I failed you. And that's how I left Jacksonville in 2013, broken. Broken, feeling like I'll never do ministry again. This is the end of my ministry. And I'll never forget the voice of the Lord meeting me in 2013 saying, hey, 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 I know things don't look the way you think they should look, but I still have a plan for your life. I know, I know you're discouraged and there's disappointment and things are not adding up, but I still, there's still a story that I'm writing. So don't try to grab the pen and start to write your own story. Let me continue to author something that you can look at 10, 15 years and say, oh, I'm so glad that I trusted. I'll never forget leaving Jacksonville, discouraged, and my wife saying, I'm so tired of being on medicine, and we're not against medicine. It was just a season where we're like, we just need something for God to break in in our lives. And we held hands, and I know this is not everybody's story, and bless you, but we held hands that morning in that car, and we said, this is enough of this, in our Mazda 626, and we prayed, and it was the last day she ever took medicine, God healed her. And for us, that's, I know, that's not everybody's story, but we needed that kiss from heaven, oh, God still sees us. 
And from that point on, God would have taken us to the nations, to Africa and Mexico. But listen, in that season, there was intense warfare. And the enemy was trying to sow accusation in our heart about who God is seeing. You've got to be careful in seasons of pressure what kind of agreements, determinations, conclusions you come about about who God is. Be careful when you feel like you're being, because beautiful things come from pressure. That diamond you've got on your finger went through immense pressure to get there. Beautiful things, but be careful what conclusions you come to about who God is and who you are in moments of pressure. So a few years ago, we were in, in, in one of those moments, because we go through moments, man. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor or not pastor, anointed, you go through pressure. And we were in the middle of an extended fast as a community, and midway through that fast, I started to have a dream every single night. And this is very unusual. Like, I, I know that dreams and all of that stuff, but, but for me, it was unusual. It wasn't like I dream every night, but every single night, I would have this reoccurring dream that was like, God, what? Are, how many of you know if you have a dream like 20 nights in a row, you're like, God may be speaking to me. <laughs> you know when God, God has to give somebody a dream 20-something nights, like, that guy's stubborn. That guy's stubborn. And every night in the dream, it was the same exact thing. I would see a priest, right, a priest, ministering before the Lord. How many of you know the Bible says in 1 Peter, we have been made a kingdom of priests, right? You don't get, there's not, you're not a priest or not, a, we're all invited into the kingdom of priests to minister to God. But I saw this priest ministering before the Lord, and he was radiant. The priest was radiant. I mean, I was drawn to the priest because of the beauty of what was happening in the moment as he was extending himself towards the Lord. Then all of a sudden in the dream, there was like this dark silhouette that would show up in the dream. And I would watch the, the, the silhouette look like a shadow whisper in the ear of the priest. And as it would begin to happen, every time I would watch the countenance of the priest change. You ever seen something sad and somebody's countenance change? Or you met somebody who their countenance looks sad? That's what was happening. The countenance of the priest would change as the whisper came. And every time in the dream, I would move towards the priest and I'd say, hey, take heart. Don't let sorrow creep in. And in the dream, I understood every single time that even though the accusation came from the outside, it, it took root on the inside. And the assignment of the enemy was to cause the priest to lose his radiance the beauty, the zeal, and cause him to divert, to abort, to, to let go of his assignment. It was to sow discouragement and to cause him to go the other way. And so as I'm having this dream, I'm like, Lord, you've got to lead me to the Bible because we are Bible people, right? We want to be rooted and grounded in the Word, right? Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. <laughs> we want to be rooted and grounded. And so I started to ask the Lord, Lord, I want to talk to me about sorrow. What, what is sorrow? And I want to define this to you this morning because it's part of what I believe the Lord wants to do. He wants to deliver us from sorrow. And he wants to give us faith and grace to go the whole way. How many of you want to go all the way? I don't want to go halfway. I want to go the whole, I want all that God has for me. And so the definition of sorrow is this. It's a feeling of deep distress, and this distress is caused by loss, disappointment, or misfortune that is suffered by oneself or others, meaning there are situations and circumstances that happen, and they're painful, they're disappointing, they're hard, and they cause distress on the inside, which will manifest as disengagement on the outside. So the Lord led me to Zechariah 3, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. Because every of every, you have your Bible, right? We have a sky Bible here. It's okay. Zechariah 3, it's an interesting story where Zechariah is inserted into a moment where the accuser, the Bible calls saying the accuser of the brethren. You've got to know this. One of the main tactics of the enemy is he comes to accuse you before God, before others, before yourself. In Revelation, it would say the accuser has been cast down. From the beginning to the end, he is known as the accuser. In Zechariah 3, you're, you're brought into a moment where Joshua, how many of you remember Joshua from the Old Testament, the high priest, he's standing before the Lord. And, and in verse 2 it says, say in standing at Joshua's right hand to be his adversary and to accuse him. 
So there's Joshua and there's Satan. But as the enemy comes to bring accusation against Joshua, the Lord intervenes. Say, he intervenes. This is, listen, this is the word from God. God will intervene if you allow him on your behalf. The Lord intervened and said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a log snatched and rescued from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and was standing before the angel of the Lord. And he spoke to those who stood before him saying, remove the garments from him. And he said to Joshua, see, see. I have caused your wickedness to be taken away from you. And I will clothe you and I will beautify you with rich robes. And so what's happening in the story? The enemy comes to accuse Joshua. And the dangerous part of this accusation is it was partially true. The accuser comes to accuse Joshua. And Joshua representing Israel is clothed in dirty garments which represented Israel's sin and separation from God. But yet in the midst of the accusation, the Lord intervenes and says, the Lord rebuke you. I have come to break accusation and to clothe you in new garments. To remove your filth from you and to give you beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, praise for heaviness. To remove the bondage of the enemy that would cause you to not see God properly. To not see yourself in light of who God is. And I'm telling you, this is so important for us as the body of Christ today. If God is leading us through seasons of transition, because transition is hard and shifting is hard, there's always the propensity to go back to what we knew. Man, talk to the people of Israel. 400 and something years saying, God, deliver us. God, deliver us. And the pressure of the, of the wilderness, because they did not know where they were going or how God was going to provide, they began to sing, it was better in Egypt. It was better there. At least there, there was a measure of security. At least there we knew how things were going to go. But, but because we're in a season of daily bread, and God is teaching us to trust him, and depend on him in new ways, it's going to require from us as a people the willingness to know that God will silence every voice of accusation. I'm telling you, if you're in this room, you've been dealing with those voices. That question, who God is, is God really that good? And even if he was that good, isn't he that good to everybody else but not you? The voice at night that tells you you're never going to see what, you, you really think God's going to do that for you? And you've trusted and you've believed. And because you've seen delay, you've lost heart. In seeing the faithfulness of God now, we lose heart. I mean, think about Jesus being with his disciples. In the very last moment of Jesus' life, he takes them into an upper room in John 13. And he begins to have the last, conver I mean, come on. It's the last conversation Jesus is going to have. John 13 through 17 is some of the most significant scriptures in all the Bible. It's Jesus' last words to those he gave his life to for three and a half years. And he begins to speak to them about the Holy Spirit being given, but he makes this statement to them. Hey, listen, do not let your hearts be troubled. That word troubled means agitated. Inward commotion meaning, hey, listen... I'm warning you now because this next season that you're about to walk through has the opportunity for you to become offended with my leadership. And I've learned this about God. That every season where God is leading me comes with the invitation to become offended with his leadership. Because God doesn't always do things the same way. Remember when God called us to Africa. We're like, yeah, we're going to go. And we sold everything. We were working at a church. We sold everything and we left. Me, my wife, and my one and a half year old son. We're like, how do we keep our son clean? How do we, my son goes and within 30 seconds, he's making angels in the red dirt. I'm like, this isn't going to work. It's going to be dirty the whole time. And I remember being there and, and we're like, okay, God, what do you want us to do? He's like, I don't want you to do anything. I brought you to Africa to die. All of those things that you think you're going to do for me, like I just, I want you to be delivered of all of those things. I want you to be led by me. I'm like, okay. And so we're there. And then all of a sudden, ISIS begins to come from the north towards the border. And all of a sudden, we're here. And we know God sent us. But the school's like, hey, listen, about an hour and a half away, they're cutting people's heads off. So you got to make a decision. Either you leave now or you stay. But, but you've got to make a choice. And we're like, okay. What do we do? Like, God, you said. And we're like, well, God said. So I guess, like, if God said we've got to be here, then there's grace for us to be here. 
But it was difficult because it was offensive. Like wisdom would have said, hey, go back home. You've got a one and a half year old. There's a lot to lose. But yet God told us you are to stay. I've sent you. And I'm telling you in this season, we're going to have to wrestle with some things. As a community, as a spiritual family, I know what I'm seeing and I know what it feels like. But I'm going to stand on what God has said. I'm not going to be moved by what I feel, right? We don't, live by, we don't live by sight. We live by what? By faith. And God leads us and he guides us. And he, and he is the God of the breakthrough. Listen, don't grow discouraged and delay. The assignment of the enemy when he brings accusation is to isolate you. And listen, an isolated Christian is chopped liver. It's spiritual suicide. And he'll tell you no one is safe. You're all alone. Just stay hidden. Just keep every ball because I have, I've been hurt. And what the heart tells you in seasons of pain, see, so one of the most painful things that happens in the Christian life is you get hurt by those closest to you. Like, oh, well, no, but they should know better. But people are people. And brokenness is brokenness. And if the enemy can get you isolated and he be, can, can begin to whisper lies, he diverts you from the assignment. And listen, there is much at stake. If God has set you, and I'm telling you, I already told you, God has set you in this region as a city on a hill. It's not going to look like everybody else. It's going to be a different assignment and people aren't going to understand it. But, but I'm telling you, God will dwell in the midst if we choose to let our hearts become liberated from the accusation. If we choose to trust Him, like He said, do not let your heart be troubled. Jesus is having this conversation, and he goes, you know where I'm going. And, and Thomas is like, we really don't, bro. No, we don't. We don't know where you're going. Show us. And then they're, they're in this conversation, and Peter's like, anywhere you go, I'm going. I will die for you. And Jesus is like, really? Well, before the rooster crows, I mean, like, he attaches Peter's denial to a sound. I mean, if you ever lived in a country, like when we lived in Africa, one of the worst things about Africa is you wake up at 3.30 in the morning, it's light, and there's roosters crowing. You're like, this is demonic. <laughs> he attaches Peter's denial to something he was going to hear all of the time. And you got to imagine, Peter, this is the dude who chops people's ears off. This is that dude. Jesus says, upon this guy, I will build my church, upon the rock. All of a sudden, Peter finds himself doing the very thing. Have you ever been here? The very thing you said, God, I will never, I will never. It's like the pressure of the moment caused you to step into that. And now you find yourself in a moment of difficulty and pain and sorrow, disappointment. But what I love about Jesus is he doesn't leave the story there. Say, he's good. I said again, this I didn't like it. He's good. He's good. He never leaves the story halfway. Peter, in John 21, I would assume he became so discouraged that you find him right back where Jesus found him. This is the guy, again, that was going to do mighty things for God. He, fought, he was one of Jesus' three. All of a sudden, he's fishing again. It's like, how did he go back to fishing? After seeing the miracles, I mean, this guy saw Jesus raise somebody from the dead. How do you go back? Because discouragement and sorrow always leads us back to the very things God delivered us from. And Jesus, instead of rebuking him and saying, see, I told you, you thought you had it going, but I knew he never accuses. What he does is he, he reinstates and he restores Peter to the original plan. Peter, do you love me, Lord? You know I love you. Peter, do you love me? You Lord, you know, feed my sheep. And he restores Peter in a fire, in a moment. And I remember, I would imagine now for the rest of his life, every time Peter would hear a rooster crow, it wouldn't be about the moment that he denied the Lord. It would be about the moment the Lord restored him. It would be a moment where it's like, oh, I messed everything. I went all the wrong ways. And Jesus built a little fire on the beach to let me know, even though I'm dysfunctional and I'm a mess, he still chooses me. Friend, you've got to know. The assignment on this house is not about 10 or 12 anointed people. 
It's a spiritual family on kingdom mission to host God. And while there is an assignment from the enemy to steal, to kill, and to destroy, John 10 says to us, I have come. This is Jesus. I have come to give you life and to give you life in abundance, in overflow. And this is the destiny of this house. It's to overflow. It's to be a pull of Bethesda to those who are hurting and broken that need healing. It's a different way. It's a people who are not living for this age, but for the age to come. They're, they're fascinated with the king who is Lord over all things. And we still listen. You still got to go to work and you still got to deal with Joe. You're going to ride in your car. Your wife, husband's going to say something sideways. You're going to have to deal with that. But our lives are not structured around what this world can promise us, which is not much. But our lives are structured around a story that God is writing. That we get to be a part of the restoration of the north side of Jacksonville. That we can be those who turn high schools, colleges upside down. We can be those that walk, but listen, you've got to be healed and liberated from every weight that would so easily entangle you. You've got to be delivered from what people think about you. If you're in the room today and you've been dealing with mental torment, why not today be the day that Jesus breaks that thing off of you? Where people have wounded you, they've hurt you, they've lied on you. I'm not saying they're right. I'm saying don't let their wrong deter you from what God wants for you. Don't be a, don't be a prisoner to those chains. Don't, don't let this moment change your view of God or your assignment within that. And I'll end with this story because it's, it's red here now. It's red. It's yelling at me. One of the things I was feeling last night is in Mark 10, there's a story of a blind man who's in Jericho. And he's, bl he's a blind man, so he's blind. The Bible calls him blind Bartimaeus, but his name is actually just Bartimaeus. We love to label people by their dysfunction, but that was, his name was Bartimaeus. And I don't know how long he was blind. He was sitting by that gate for a long time, but he catches wind that Jesus was entering into the town. And for some reason, something inside of him said, hey, I've got to get to that man. I've been blind, I'm lacking, I'm broken, there's dysfunction, but, but if I could just get to him or he can just get to me, everything would change. So as Jesus is walking by the gate, he begins to shout. I mean, we've lost that. Sometimes it's like we've got to be so dignified all the time. But like when you're actually in like in, in, a, in a terrible situation, you don't care what nobody thinks. Forget you, you didn't die for me. You can't heal me. As he said, Gee, he says, son of David, have mercy. He begins to cry out. And it's so, it's so disruptive to everyone around that all the religious are like, hey, shh, don't, don't do that. It's Jesus. Just If he wants to come to you, he'll just come to you. But something, the desperation on the inside of him to be delivered from his current situation said, no, no, no. I'm not going to let this one pass me by. Son of David, have mercy. And as he was crying out in desperation in that moment, Jesus, he turns aside. And he says, tell him to come. And the Bible says in Mark that all of a sudden, he takes off his cloak. Just picture this, right? At that time, to be a beggar, you needed to have a cloak that would identify you by your dysfunction. They were beggars, so they had cloaks on and they would ask for money. And that's how they knew within the community, oh, that guy's blind, he's a beggar. But the moment he caught wind that Jesus had turned aside, the Bible says he throws off his cloak as if to know, hey, now that I've got Jesus' attention, I'm never going to need that again. Everything's about to change. So finally he's face to face with Jesus. I love Jesus. The blind person walks up to Jesus and Jesus looks at the blind guy and he's like, what do you want me to do for you? What? Uh, bro, I can't see. I, but, but he wants us to ask, right? Those who ask, receive. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, the door will be opened. There's an inquiring of him. Ask me and I will give. So the guy's like, I want to be able to see. And he goes, your faith has healed you. And he's restored. 
And I just wonder if in Bold City Church, what's today? The 28th. My days are all turned upside down. I've been with no kids for three days. But I wonder, like, if in this moment there are some that's like, hey, I just, I'm ready to take off that thing that has been weighing me down. To fully be able to step in to all that God has. And it's going to require courage. It's going to require, it's one of the things I love about Pastor Jason. The authenticity and the transparency and the vulnerability is so rare. But for some of you in the room, you've been dealing with that accusation. The enemy has said things over you. And while they came from without, they have taken root within. And they've been wearing you out. You're tired and no nap's going to fix that tiredness. We isolate, we get alone, and the enemy begins to torment us and wear our souls down. And before we know it, we cannot even stand. And this is the last thing I'll say. When Jesus was in the garden, he invited a few to stand with him in his most vulnerable, painful, difficult moment. And in Luke 22, it says this. The disciples had fallen asleep, and they had fallen asleep due to sorrow. In Jesus' most vulnerable moment, those who he invited to stand with him could not because the sorrow within was affecting that without. And I'm telling you, I have faith this morning that God wants to heal and to liberate hearts. He wants to deliver because, again, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. So, friend, today's a good day for freedom. It's a good day for you to divorce yourself from the accusation of the enemy and to step into all that God has. So can we just stand together? Are we good for ministry? It would be our absolute honor to pray for you this morning. To be able to ask the Lord to heal every broken place and to be able to see God restored. I do believe there's an invitation for you to step out and to step in, right? We're stepping out of all of the things that Pastor Jason said, that the weight that so easily entangles us and we're stepping into all that God has. John 10, 10 overflow exceedingly abundantly more than you can think, ask, or imagine. And I have faith for that this morning. So I'm going to pray really quick. And I'm going to ask you to just be honest about your current, mo about your current situation. And we're going to pray. And we really felt like Pastor Jason said it's a moment that God has ordained. So there's no pressure. If God's not in it, we don't want it. <laughs> but I do believe there's, there's a moment. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this moment. Even now, we want to be still and know that you are God. We ask you for liberty now for those that have been dealing with depression and anxiety and torment and fear and doubt. We thank you right now for the spirit of liberty that would liberate every heart, that would remove aloneness, and would heal. So if that's you in the room, I'm just going to invite you forward now. It's going to take courage. There's going to be a few, but I just believe God sent us for this. Oh, thank you. You're so, f thank you. Just, just forward here. We're as a sign of like, I'm stepping out, I'm stepping in. And we're going to pray. It's not going to be anything weird. We're going to agree with what God has over you. But even, even as you come, just receive from God. You don't have to, we don't have to beg him. He wants to touch us more than we want to be touched. So we just receive from God. We just close our eyes. If you're out there, I would encourage you, let's take a few minutes to pray for these that are here. For freedom, for liberty, for life. Father, even now we pray for grace. We bind every attack of the enemy. 
And we thank you for life. We thank you for freedom. God, remove disappointment, remove shame, remove condemnation. Can we pray together? Remove condemnation, Lord. We, we together agree to break every assignment of the enemy over every one of your sons and daughters in this room. We ask for peace, hope, joy. Holy Spirit, fill. 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 You know, one of the things that we don't do well in the U.S. that we learned while we were on the mission field is we preach a gospel that's a gospel without suffering. But the gospel without suffering is not actually the gospel at all. In Isaiah 53, Jesus, it says to us that he is a man acquainted with sorrow. It's not that sorrow doesn't come, it's that it doesn't take root. We're familiar with sorrow, but we have a high priest who is moved to compassion. And oh friend, I'm here to tell you today, he has been moved. Oh, he sees you, he sees you. He's not looking over you. He's not passing you by. Father, we just welcome you. We welcome your presence into this room right now, Lord. Oh, son of David, have a mercy this morning. Have a mercy this morning. Oh, son of David, have a mercy. Son of David, have a mercy. Oh, good shepherd, would your rod and staff bring comfort this morning? Lord, would you bring liberty to our hearts, the hearts that feel weary, all who are heavy and weary, and would you come to the Father? He will give you rest this morning. He will bring you rest, for his yoke is easy and his burden is so light. Jesus, your yoke is easy. We don't have to strive because your yoke is easy. Father, with your mercy and your grace, just reign in this place this morning. for any in the room that are dealing with mental torment. My wife for 18 months received all kind of diagnoses and I'm not saying, I'm not here to label anyone but I just felt a grace for anybody who's being tormented in the mind to just pray with you, to pray a sound mind for the spirit of fear and to be given, the Bible says he gives us the mind of Christ and he fills us with peace, hope and joy. So if that's you, would you just lift up your hands, we're going to pray. We're going to believe the Lord to break that, and there's no shame. There is no shame. But God, even now, all over the room, if there's some prayer leaders, that'd be amazing. We're going to anoint, and we're just going to pray. 
We're going to ask the Lord to break that off of you. Whether you felt like it was generational, whatever. We're going to ask the Spirit now to just liberate. So, Father, all over the room, you see every hand. Just all together, God, we ask you for liberty. Where, where words have been spoken, where things have been said, God, we ask you to pull up every root. To heal every mind. To bring everything into balance. Everything into order. We thank you for a sound mind. We thank you for peace. Peace. We tell every voice to be silenced that is not of the Holy Spirit. And God, we ask you for grace now. Grace. That perfect love would cast out all fear. Come, Holy Spirit. Break every lie. Every word that has been spoken over you. God, we ask you to uproot every word. Every word that has been spoken. Would you lift off the root? And would you speak? We thank you that your blood speaks a better word. Your blood speaks a better word. freedom there is freedom God would you heal deliver lift your eyes to heaven there is freedom God we pray over this community God and we say yes and amen to every dream and every desire freedom that every dream every word that you have spoken would come to pass that your yoke is easy and your burden is light.
last thing I want to say is I remember being in rooms like this and not having the ability to come forward. And it's like, no, it's too much disappointment. It's too much pain. I just want to say to those of you that you're in the seats, God cares for you and he sees you. I just want to be able to see you. God, God sees you and he cares about your pain. And just because you didn't come forward today doesn't mean that you don't care or that you're broken. But, but I want to let you know in this moment, God's love is extended and he sees you in your pain and he will not pass you by. God writes the best stories. And maybe today, the pain of returning forward, it was just, I'm like, I can't do that again. I want you to know God loves you and God cares for you. And God will make crooked paths straight. He is the God of the impossible. And even though you don't see it now, He's working. And so, Father, we bless all of these sons and daughters in the room. We thank you for the destiny for the dream, God, we speak hope and encouragement. We thank you that you care, that you are the God who sees, the God who hears. And God, even now we receive your love. We ask you to bring us back to life. We love you. Would you can we just lift up our hands for just a moment? We love you. Make our hearts soft, make our hearts tender. Help us to feel again. In any place where the enemy is destroyed, God, we ask you for life. In any place where he is stolen, we ask you for restoration. Fill them with your love. Fill them with hope. Fill them with peace. Fill them with joy. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for life and life in abundance.
Oh, there it is. Hey. Wow. Well, I would say that that was definitely a divine appointment. Hey, babe. How? Some of you are trying to figure out what's going on. Look at you. You're like, hey, should we clap for that? Absolutely. Hey, babe. There's something that uh, Gio said. There's a lot he said that I thought was incredible, but every season presents a new opportunity to be offended with the Lord's leadership, something of that nature. It, I was like, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. I can tell you this, the idea of pursuing freedom, like don't leave here and let it stop. Fight and contend and believe for freedom, amen? And this week, I want to encourage you every day, every day, would you take time, just a few minutes, and would you pray for the over 200 young people that we're going to have at camp this week, that God would wreck them and change their life. Amen. And do me a favor. Uh, uh, can you give it up to God and thank him for the word that he brought through Pastor Gio today? Thank you guys. Thank you guys for hearing the voice of the Lord and spontaneously stopping by. I thank God for the divine setup. Amen. You guys be blessed. Have an incredible week.